Hi, we're about to start. If you could please take your seats. Okay, we're going to get started. Hi, welcome to the 221st meeting of the New York Linux Users Group, the latest in our regular monthly meetings. Tonight we have Victor Duhovny, who will be giving us a talk on DNSSEC and Dane. I'd like to say how much we appreciate our sponsor, Two Sigma, for continuing to provide this lovely space, and thank you to everyone here for joining us tonight. Two Sigma is hiring. Um, if you look, Mahoto is in the corner over there. Oh, his, his hand is raised if you're interested. They're, I believe they're hiring list Linux systems people. Um, uh, Pavel will be here for a little bit too. Um, tonight, before we get started, we have our usual request, silence your cell phones. Do not eat snacks during the talk because they make noise. Uh, as usual, we will be recording tonight's meeting and posting it on our YouTube channel within a few weeks. We'll put the link in the meetup.com meeting comments when it's ready. Please use the mics for questions so we, they can be heard in the recording. We'd like to take a moment to thank all our sponsors past and present including Two Sigma, Bloomberg, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and Pearson for their support. In addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years. Uh, workshops, uh, is anybody here from workshops? Uh, the next workshop, uh, the, the workshops are at NYU Silver Building, room 512, 32 Waverly Place. The next workshop will be Tuesday, October 23rd from 7 to 9 p.m. and is on the meetup page. Uh, the next general meeting will be Tuesday, November 27th. Daniel Walsh will be giving us a talk about their next generation containers uh, and their tools, including Builda, Podman, and Cryo. And this is a Docker alternative. Uh, keep an eye out on our meetup page for that. It should be up shortly. After the presentation, we'll be heading to Cupping Room Cafe at 359 West Broadway, two blocks east of here. Final reminders, uh, silence your phones, put away loud wrappers, use the mics for questions at the end. Okay, on to the talk. Uh, Victor is the maintainer of the TLS stack in Postfix and the Dane and X509 support in OpenSSL. Uh, he also developed and operates a DNSSEC Dane survey, which helps to drive adoption and detect and fix implementation obstacles. Now, please welcome Victor Duhovny, giving us DNSSEC and Dane. Uh, thank you. Just checking my mic. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we're good. All right. Uh, in terms of questions, uh, I'd like to leave very detailed questions to the end. But if somebody has a very high-level question, some concept that's not getting across, it's possible that others have the same uh, issue or that I'm not explaining it thoroughly. So by all means, feel free to interrupt with kind of big picture questions. I'd like to handle those in real time. Uh, but we'll get to the details ideally later. Uh, OK, so I'm here to talk to you about DNSSEC and Dane. I'm not going to give you a hands-on tutorial. I don't think this is what this talk is about. Hopefully, I'll uh, convey some of the essential elements of both. Uh, and we'll uh, be able to take away some things we can do. All right. So the first thing I want to talk to you about uh, is uh, DNSSEC. Uh, I'll give you an overview of why DNSSEC exists, uh, you know, how it works, uh, how to keep it uh, running smoothly and properly in your environment a little bit, um, and some indication of what the status of DNSSEC deployment is uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the world at large. So um, why do we have DNSSEC? Uh, we have DNSSEC because uh, DNSS given to us by Maka Petris and friends back in the 80s 
uh, has some notable security deficits. Uh, the first thing is that uh, DNS replies are far too easy to spoof even for an off-path attacker who doesn't get to see the communication between the resolver and the authoritative name server. They can easily uh, predict and outrace the responses of the authoritative name server in many cases. Uh, just recently, there was another attack where somebody discovered that you can use IP fragments in interesting ways to attack DNS, DNS traffic. If you can predict the, the size of a response from an authoritative server that's fragmented, then you can supply the second fragment uh, ahead of the, of the second fragment supplied by the authority. When you're supplying the second fragment, you don't have to know the port number or the DNS transaction ID. Those are in the first fragment. All you have to guess is the fragment offset uh, and the 16-bit IP uh, fragment ID. Uh, so so non-DNS continues to be fairly easy to spoof. Uh, so, uh, and then of course on-path attackers are in a far better place. They can manipulate unsigned DNSSEC at will. Um, and uh, you may or may not trust your cache, and you certainly may or may not trust anybody who in a Wi-Fi hot, uh, hot spot might be sitting between you uh, and the, uh, the Wi-Fi node. And the other thing that's important is that certain kinds of answers that DNS gives, unlike IP addresses, uh, actually have security consequences. When DNS gives you indirection, when it tells you what the MX record is of a domain, or the SRV record is for some service, usually to make a secure connection to that service, you're going to try and authenticate that you have a connection to the name of the providing host. But if that name came from DNS, now your security is toast because you're deriving the name over an insecure channel. So validating a name that you got from the attacker does not protect you. No certificate is going to help you if the name that you're looking for in that certificate cannot be trusted. Uh, so while some use cases get by with an insecure DNS, uh, the web doesn't employ MX records or SRV records, uh, other use cases suffer when DNS data cannot, when DNS data cannot be trusted. Okay, so what does DNS want to do for us? Um, the first thing that DNS, DNSSEC wants to do is to give us end-to-end -end data integrity. What that means is that when I publish some data in my DNS zone file as an authoritative name server, uh, the receiving system that's consuming DNS can be sure that it's getting the data that I put in there and not some attacker or even an untrusted intermediate cache. The, uh, the other thing that DNSSEC wants to give us is downgrade resistance. If I am going to sign the data and stand behind it and prove to you that the data is correct, it should not easily be possible to indicate that, no, 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 Victor's domain is not signed. It's going to give you insecure data. So not only am I going to sign my domain, but the fact that my domain is signed should not be something that somebody can hide from a validating resolver. And uh, lastly, uh, an important caveat, uh, DNSSEC at the time did not have uh, privacy as a driving goal. DNSSEC does not encrypt the traffic that carries your DNS queries towards the authoritative server, nor does it encrypt the answers coming back from the authoritative server. They're merely signed. DNSSEC traffic is in the clear. If your threat model is that somebody is spying on your queries and building up a, a dossier on your internet activities, then DNSSEC alone will not protect you. You need other technologies uh, like Deprive or others uh, to protect you in that use case. Okay, so uh, how does DNSSEC try to meet the goals uh, of giving you end-to-end -end integrity, uh, not needing to trust the caches, and being able to rely on the data you get. So first of all, DNSSEC has, a, has a, a trust anchor keys. Like with the web CAs, there is some set of keys that you trust to stand you know, reliably uh, for the facts that they sign. Unlike with the web CAs where we have uh, hundreds uh, of different certification authorities, uh, each one of which is able to you know, uh, sign data about any domain name whatsoever. DNSSEC is hierarchical. It follows 
the delegations of the DNS domains from one organization to, to another. And so at, at the root of the DNSSEC, there's only one set of, uh, of keys, you know, published by the root zone operators. And then as you delegate domains, other keys sign domains below them. That doesn't mean that you're limited to only trusting the root zone operating by ICANN. If you have your own domain, you can, uh, in your resolver, configure the trust anchors for your own domain locally and not be subject to the whims of whatever it is that the root name servers might tell you. So as an operator of an internal network, you can configure DNSSEC as a little island and sign your own domain and trust your own keys and nobody else can compromise the validity of your own records because you've pinned your own trust anchors. But by and large, DNS uses a single set of trust anchor keys, which rolled last week for the first time. Uh, so ICANN is now publishing keys uh, generated in 2017 rather than keys generated in 2010. Um, the next thing is, of course, in addition to the keys that sign a particular node in the DNS tree, uh, we have sign delegation. When control is transferred from the root zone, signing just the various TLDs, to .com, which signs all of the domains under .com, uh, the root zone signs the keys that .com is going to use so that when we see .com's keys, we know that they're legitimate uh, keys for .com and not something that somebody made up uh, uh, as an attacker. Uh, the signatures uh, in, uh, in DNSSEC cover all the records in the zone. They sign everything that you might publish. They don't, pu they don't sign glue records those NS records that point at you at the name servers for a subdomain, the authoritative NS records for a subdomain are in that subdomain, are signed by that domain. Glue records are delivered from the parent, they're not authoritative, so the parent does not sign glue. Sometimes that matters, um, so I thought I'd mention it. Um, DNSSEC has authenticated denial of existence. That means that not only does it sign the data that you will get back in answers, uh, such as A records and MX records and so on, but it also signs the answers that indicate that the records you're asking for don't exist, either because the domain name doesn't exist entirely or because the domain name exists but has no data of the requested type. So it's no data and NX domain. Both of those are signed. Part of the reason why that had to happen is that at the very least, the records that indicate that the domain is delegated securely uh, or their absence have to be signed. So if you want to say, I'm delegating this subdomain to dot, to dot com, and by the way, dot com is signed, that's great, but nobody should be able to say, well, by the way, dot com is not signed. Those records that indicate the signatures for the dot com keys don't exist. So forgery, if non-existence, would have broken the DNSSEC signed delegation model. DNSSEC would have become downgradable. Once it was possible uh, to approve that you know, that no, no uh, these things do exist, non-existence cannot be forged, it was then applied more broadly than just to uh, uh, delegations of keys. All right, so, uh, so what the heck are these keys I'm talking about? So in DNSSEC, there are two types of keys. Long-term keys are registered with the parent domain or are trust anchors. So uh, in the case of the root zone, uh, the keys, well, you know, are uh, configured into all of the various resolvers and are uh, automatically updated when new ones are introduced into the root zone. Uh, but in any case, uh, they tend to be stable for, for years if, or, or at least months. Um, shorter term zone signing keys sign all the records in the zone. They are sometimes use weaker algorithms that take, that take less time to break, but are rolled more frequently so that in principle, at least, it is impractical to break them during the key's lifetime. Because they're just signature keys, not encryption keys, it doesn't matter if they're broken after they're no longer in use. So if somebody broke the keys that you used for DNSSEC a year ago, whoop-dee-da, doesn't matter. They should have done it a year ago when they could have lied about your DNS. Lying about the state of your DNS a year ago now uh, is, is, is pointless. Um, so it's okay to, let's say, perhaps use 1,024-bit zone signing keys for 90 days if you believe that you know, the various state-level agencies can't, in practice, you know, break 
your keys every 90 days, that that's too expensive. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, uh, on this slide is an example of the DNS key records for the Czech Republic. Uh, I apologize, I have a few more slides about the Czech Republic, and every once in a while I show my agent column Czechoslovakia. I hope I won't do it, but if I do, apologies in advance to anybody who, uh, who cares about the Czech Republic. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is their DNS key RR set. Uh, they have two keys. One is a key signing key. That's the long-term key that's registered with the root zone. And the other is their zone signing key. Uh, the, the way that you tell them apart is that the 257, is the, the flags field, is a bit mask. And the, the one bit indicates that you're, a key, that you're a key signing key. And the 256 bit key indicates that you're valid for signing the zone. Both keys can sign zone data, so they're both useful for signing records. But, but the KS case is, is, uh, additionally indicates that it's really intended to only sign keys and not really intended to sign any other records in the zone. These semantics are not enforced, but it's good practice to make sure your KSKs only sign the root of the zone and your ZSKs only sign the rest of the zone data, uh, though it's possible to violate these without DNSSEC breaking. Uh, uh, the other fields there, the three is a protocol. Uh, the protocol in this case is DNSSEC. So every DNS key used for DNSSEC will have that number three in its record. And the 13 here indicates ECDSA. Uh, the uh, prime 256 NIST curve. Some people uh, uh, frown upon these these days. You know, starting to move towards some some elliptic curve crypto invented by by Dan Bernstein and friends. But in DNSSEC, that stuff is too bleeding edge. Uh, so we can use RSA or ECDSA. Pretty much everything else is not yet practical. Um, okay, this is a picture. Uh, using a site called dnsviz.net. It's a fantastic site for uh, understanding DNSSEC problems often, or if you have any, or validating that your DNSSEC is properly configured. Here on the left, we see last week's before the key rollover a picture of the root zone. We see the top level key, uh, 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 which is uh, the uh, ICANN 2010 key signing key. Uh, it's an RSA key of 2048 bits. It signs itself. It signs the other signing key a little bit to below and to its right. That is now the new root key. The two nodes there that the, in gray have flipped. The 2010 key will now be found at the top. Uh, uh, sorry, the 2017 key is now at the top, and 2010 key is still hanging out there until be revoked sometime in March, I believe, or something like that, some months away. It'll go away from the root zone. Uh, what we see to the left, though, is the zone signing key for the root domain. That's changed with some frequency. Uh, I believe it's something like every 90 days the root zone is re-signed with a new zone signing key. There is no hoopla around rotating the zone signing keys. That rollover is automatic. They're signed by the key signing keys, which nobody needs to pin anywhere. So you just learn them on the fly, and that enables you to validate the root zone. And then immediately below that, we see the DS record, which I'll describe in more record in, in, in a minute in more detail, that allows the root zone to certify the keys of the zone below it. In this case, it's the Czech Republic. And so what we're seeing um, uh, on, in the right half of this picture uh, is the continuation of the, uh, of the one on the left going down from the DS record in the root zone towards the DNS keys of the Czech Republic. Uh, and then, uh, uh, again, they have a key signing key, they have a zone signing key, and they again sign another DS record. So what are these DS records? Uh, these DS records, um, or dele uh, delegation signer records, uh, are signed digests of, of, the, of the authentic key that uh, is associated with a child domain. So here we see a dig command that looks up the DS records for the CZ zone. And even though we asked for a record about DS, the answer will come from the root zone. DS records have the funny property that when you ask for DS for example.com, the answer won't come from example.com, it'll come from com. It's the only record whose authoritative answer comes from the parent of the domain you ask about rather than the domain you're asking about. 
So the root zone returns the DS records for .cz, and what it says is that it's got a key ID of 2237, an algorithm of 13, a, a, hash, uh, a hash signature algorithm of 2, and then a whole bunch of binary bits encoded in hex. The key ID is, is, allows you to match up the DS record with a key that you find in the child zone. It speeds up identifying the correct key. The 13 in this case is a number registered with IANA. That's the one that stands for ECDSA, 256-bit uh, NIST curve. Uh, the 2 stands for SHA-2256, and this is again a number registered in some IANA documents and various RFCs. And there you see the digest of the uh, CZ uh, key. By the way, uh, CZ was the first top-level domain to adopt elliptic curve. Uh, so uh, at the moment, there are just two top-level domains with elliptic curve signatures, and that's Czech Republic and Brazil. Uh, all of the others are using RSA, 2048-bit. Uh, so, so these are the DS records. What they are, because they come along with signatures. The signature is not in the DS record. Every record in DNSSEC is signed. So the signature for the DS record that, are, that will ar arrive together with it in the DNS response will have the root zone attesting to the validity of this DS record. The hash in the DS record then lets you identify that the key that you're seeing in the .com DN, uh, or .cz, in this case, DNS, uh, uh, DNS key RR set, is in fact the correct one and not, and not fraudulent. And uh, when a domain delegates uh, responsibility for a sub portion of the subtree to another domain, uh, and, it, and the parent domain is signed, there are only two possibilities as to how it can do this delegation. It can do the delegation in such a way that we expect the child zone to be signed, also to support DNSSEC. In that case, it must publish DS records that attest to the keys of the child domain. If the child domain is not signed, hasn't adopted DNSSEC, then the parent zone must include in its data pr a proof that the DS record of the child is missing. This is done through NSEC records that we'll talk about soon. So in any case, either way, there's always either a DS record attesting that the delegation is secure or denial of existence attesting that it's not. So this is again the picture for the, for the Czech Republic. We're now seeing that the nick.cz domain is delegated from CZ. It's got a DNS key that was attested by the CZ DS record. And then its zone signing key signs all of these wonderful records, SOA and MX and, and so on. And they also have another, S, another zone signing key that's either a future one they're preparing to later sign the zone, or a past one that used to sign the zone but hasn't quite been removed yet. I'm not sure which. It doesn't much matter. Uh, but you see one zone signing key that's active and another one that's not yet active or, or, or was active but is no longer. Let's talk a little bit about denial of existence in DNSSEC. As I mentioned, it is necessary to make DNSSEC downgrade resistance uh, because otherwise you could deny the existence of DS records and you could lie and say, sorry, .com is not signed. Dukhavne.org, sorry, that's not signed. Because DNSSEC has signed denial of existence, those lies are difficult to manufacture without having control of the keys that do the signing for such statements. So there are two ways to do denial of existence in DNSSEC. One is called NSEC records. They were originally introduced when DNSSEC was first defined. What those do is that they sign a chain of every name in your zone, it gets put into an alphabetically sorted list. And um, each pair is signed as a predecessor and a successor pair. When somebody asks you a query about something that doesn't exist, you obtain the pair that includes that name that they asked for in, in that interval between the, the first entry and the second entry. If your uh, domain that you asked for is not the first domain in the pair, and it's never the second domain in the pair in, in a valid answer, if, if it was equal to either, it should always be the first. Uh, then they know that the domain doesn't exist because there's a signature over the pair saying that these domains are adjacent and there's nothing between them. On the other hand, if your question matches the first element of the pair, then you know that the domain does exist. But there's a type bitmask returned in the NSEC record. You see it here 
as A and S, SOA, and dot, 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 various other records. If, you, if the record type you're asking for, let's say MX, is not in the type bitmask, then you know that that name has no MX records. It only has A, SOA, and whatever dot, dot, dot stood for. And therefore, every answer, whether it's NX domain or no data, is validated as a negative answer by the NSEC pair that encloses the question. So that was straightforward enough, but some people objected. Uh, and they objected on two grounds. One is that this design makes it trivial to walk the zone. I can obtain this full sequence of, of NSEC records by just asking for them, uh, and therefore enumerate the entire zone contents. Many of us think that's not a substantial risk. DNS data is essentially public data. If it's secret data, don't put it in DNS. The DNS is a public database. However, uh, nevertheless, one can make a reasonable case that it shouldn't be so easy to walk the zone, even if the data ultimately can't be relied upon to stay secret. Uh, the other problem with NSEC chains is that they have to be complete. They have to list every single domain in your zone, whether it's signed or not. And for zones like .com with 130 million you know, entries, it means a heck of a lot of signing and a fairly large NSEC record set uh, in the .com zone, where at the time that .com was signed, almost none of its domains, and to this day the majority of its domains, are unsigned. And so it's a shame to have to generate a signature even for the domains that are insecure. And so NSEC 3 was invented, and NSEC 3 addresses both uh, both concerns. In NSEC 3, instead of chaining together all the names in your zone, you chain together their SHA hashes. And so somebody who wants to walk your zone and discover the names of all the, zo uh, of all the domains in your zone has to break the SHA hashes. Now we know that SHA hash breaking is something to which, in which people have invested a lot recently. Uh, and so this pretty efficient kit at doing dictionary attacks on SHA hashes. And yet, it really discourages sort of casual zone walking to a sufficient extent that I think it's about the level of protection that you need. The SHA hashing in NSEC 3 supports uh, a, an additional number of iterations. You, do, you, you can hash more than once. You can hash your data sort of repeatedly 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times to try and frustrate dictionary attacks. It turns out that these extra iterations do more harm than good. Don't bother. They cost you CPU, they cost latency and DNS lookups, and they don't really deter the attacker enough. The, the, the constant factors that are incurred here aren't a sufficient deterrent. And they can even reduce your security. So don't go there. Um, all right, so the other thing that NSEC 3 has is, the, is an opt-out bit. It enables you to set the opt-out bit and sign only the nodes in your zone that are securely delegated and skip all the others. And if you're a zone like .com that essentially contains only delegations to other domains, if you sign, including your NSEC 3 chain, only the domains that are securely delegated, then anything that falls between two nodes is not securely delegated. And with, it, with the opt-out bit, you don't learn whether it's not securely delegated, but, but is in fact delegated, or it doesn't exist. When a domain is unsigned in this manner, non-existence is insecure. You're uncertain as to whether an answer about that domain you know, is true with respect to existence or, or insecure delegation. They look the same. Uh, this has rather unfortunate properties in some cases uh, that are not .com and similar domains with very sparse signing. So I very much recommend that you not use the opt-out bit. Some people find how-tos and you know, turn on the opt-out bit in their domain because they see it. Don't do it in your own zones. It's just for .com and friends. The opt-out bit is not for you, unless you start another TLD. OK, so here's a picture of denial of existence. The one on the left is for Sweden denying the existence of xyzzy.iis.se. IIS is the uh, Swedish registry. Uh, and what we see there is that they're using NSEC records. The reason Sweden is using NSEC records is that first of all, uh, around half or more of their zones are, uh, of their subdomains are actually signed. Sweden is heavily DNSSEC you know, deployed. Uh, and the other thing is that Sweden actually publishes their entire zone for, for anybody to come and get. So there's nothing secret in their zone. 
Uh, so once that's done, they can use NSEC records. NSEC records are a little cheaper to operate. That you know, they're more efficient at runtime for both the authoritative server and for the resolver. None of this hashing overhead. Uh, and what's more, uh, the two arrows that you see there in the diagram show that two NSEC records were returned to validate the answer and an SOA record. So there were three signatures, three records and three signatures in the response to prove the non-existence of xyzzy.se. On the other hand, my domain, uh, just as a fashion statement, is using NSEC3. Not that I need it. There's nothing secret in my domain either. But I thought I would use NSEC3 to give it a go. So with NSEC3, uh, it turns out that typically, uh, though it's a coincidence, you need three NSEC3 records to prove non-existence as a rule. Sometimes it's two, but often it's three. And then you need an SOA. So my packet is a little bit bigger. It's got four records and four signatures instead of three records and three signatures. Uh, and there's some hashing going on to do the proof. So this is less efficient, but it gives me, in theory, a little bit more privacy. Uh, but this is a proof that xyzzy.dukhovny.org doesn't exist. By the way, dukhovny.org has open AXFR. So you know, all, uh, all pretense that there are secrets in my zone are, are blown right there. I don't restrict AXFR. Zone transfers for those uh, who may not have heard of AXFRs. Uh, Can you explain why there's a three instead of two? Uh, the reason is that for NSEC 3, uh, in order to establish the validity of wildcard-based responses, you have to know who the, who the actually existing ancestor is, immediate ancestor is, for uh, a domain whose non-existence you want to show. You have to show some parent that does exist, and in fact has to be the, the closest and closer proof has to be delivered. And then you have to show that the wildcard under that doesn't exist and the child domain doesn't exist. And the closest and closer proof in NSEC 3 adds an additional record. With NSEC records, the closest and closer is implicit from the names that you deliver in the pair. It can be readily derived from the answer. But in NSEC 3, the closest and closer has to be explicit. You can't compute it from the, from the NSEC chain alone because of all the hashing. This matters when the name you're asking for is more than one layer deep in the domain. So if you ask for foo.bar.example.com, you have to prove whether bar does it or doesn't exist. Whereas if you give me an NSEC pair within which I lie, you can infer whether the ancestor does exist or not by looking at the elements of that chain. So, you know, uh, uh, this, is, this is kind of a low-level detail, but yes, NSEC3 incurs an extra, uh, extra record that has to be delivered as a rule. So how do we get uh, DNSSEC to go? Uh, so I use bind for my authoritative name server. I don't use it for a recursive name service, but I use it only as my authoritative name server. And I've configured bind to automatically do the re-signing for me. So every time a record signature gets slightly stale, uh, it automatically remembers to go back and, and sign it. Uh, and so that's done with in the zone stanza. I have auto DNSSEC maintain and inline signing yes. And that tells bind, go ahead, automatically update the zone as necessary, and generate new signatures. And I don't have to run any cron jobs for this. Bind does it automatically. The other thing that I have in there is that I've enabled DNSSEC. That's not enabling DNSSEC validation, by the way. This is for an authoritative server. It enables DNSSEC answers to iterative name servers that come and ask me questions. Uh, and, the other, and, and I also have DNSSEC, DNS key, KSK only. Yes, I only learned about that yesterday. It means that my root, uh, my, my DNS key RR set at the top of my domain is signed only with the key signing key and not with the zone signing key. It slightly shrinks the size of my DNS key answers without in any way weakening my, my domain or, 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 or causing any problems. And since smaller DNS packets are better than bigger DNS packets, that's a perfectly sensible thing to do. The root zone has the property that only the key signing key signed all the other DNS keys. Uh, if, we, if we went back to Sweden, we'd see that uh, their zone signing key also signed the DNS key. Uh, and so this, the number of signatures they return with their DNS key is larger, but it needn't be. So my zone now has only the key signing key signing the DNS keys, and the zone signing key signs all the other records, but doesn't sign the DNS key itself. Okay. So 
uh, that was bind. I use unbound for recursive validation. Uh, so in unbound, I just, you know, this mo module config statement uh, tells unbound to validate as well as to do iterative uh, resolution. And I configure an auto trust anchor file. The auto part means that when I can roll their keys for the root zone, unbound will notice new keys showing up. And if they're signed as key signing keys for the root zone, Unbound will keep will pick them up and incorporate them into its trust anchor file for future validation. So that when some day later that new key signing key starts signing the root zone, I'll be ready to validate it based on the new key. So this is important. I I saw that not all operating systems some time ago uh, made it possible for this rollover to take place. Sometimes the packages would deliver the root key files, the trust anchor file, with the wrong permissions, so that Unbound while it's running won't be able to update the trust anchor, fee, uh, trust anchor file. Uh, when I installed FreeBSD, I was pleased to see that all the permissions were, were just spot on and everything was correctly laid out. Uh, and Unbound would deploy itself in a mode in which it was able to update these keys correctly. Probably recent re Linux packages do the same thing. Uh, and uh, the automatic trust anchor management just works. I don't do something called QName minimization in my recursive resolver. QName minimization that means that when you send queries to the root name server to .com and so on, you ask them about the shortest possible name uh, that gets you the answer. So if I want to know www.foo.example.com, instead of asking root, tell me about www.foo.example.com, I'll ask the root zone, tell me about com. And they won't learn what the real domain is that I'm looking for. And this is sort of privacy enhancement. You leak less of the day details of your queries to the, to the authoritative servers near the top of the DNS tree. On the other hand, it slows you down a bunch uh, and sometimes even fails uh, because uh, some domains mishandle what are known as empty non-terminals, names that exist in the middle of a DNS name that don't themselves have any records are not occasionally handled correctly. Uh, and so you might get the wrong answer if you ask for an intermediate node with no data associated with it. Uh, and so it's a QNAME minimization has a cost uh, of reliability. At the moment, I'm not optimizing for privacy here, so I have QNAME minimization off. Uh, support for it's improving. You can turn it on. You know, it's, it's cool. It works for most people. Uh, my name server is unusual. It also runs my DNS survey. Uh, which uh, does you know uh, a few a few tens of millions of queries each day with a cache hit rate of about one in a million uh, so uh, it's 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 a setup where I don't have to worry about privacy too much uh, and I cap the lifetimes of maximum TTLs I receive unbound usually caps them at one day bound at seven bind at seven I don't trust any record for more than two hours uh, if you get any bad data it's good to flush it out quickly. Uh, after it's been in your cache for a few hours or a day, uh, all of, most of the effects of caching are already amortized. You don't need to cache things for, for months or weeks. Uh, so I recommend a reasonable cap on the lifetime. Zone signing. Um, I'm showing you examples. I'll, I'll probably rush through this uh, of how to sign your zone with, uh, with the DNSSEC, uh, low-level DNSSEC tools. Uh, that uh, that create keys. Uh, my friend Wes Hardaker, uh, who is uh, in fact involved in the operation of the B root name server, so he knows a few things about DNS, I recommended a tool called Zone Signer. Uh, so take a look into that, see if you like it. Uh, but this is how you would do it, sort of a bare metal, signing your own keys. So the first thing is that we have to generate a key. Uh, so I, here I'm generating an ECDSA P256 key. Uh, those lead to smaller, much smaller DNS packets than than RSA, uh, and uh, I think for that reason are quite advantageous because the main concern with DNSSEC is really the increased size of DNS responses. ECDSA leads to much smaller signatures than RSA. Uh, I first generate a KSK, uh, and then I generate a zone signing key as well, and then I make sure that the keys belong to the name D user, not to root, because they're only readable to their owner. And bind will reload the keys occasionally uh, while after it's dropped privileges from root. So you want to make sure that your keys are readable 
to the whatever user account runs your name server. Uh, then I add the auto DNSSEC maintain and inline signing to my zone, uh, and I'm you know our our DNS our uh, NDC uh, load keys sign away and I'm good. Uh, Okay, um, the next thing that I do is I derive my DS records. So I run, you know, sort of the commands near the bottom of the screen to generate the DS record that I can give to my registrar and say, here, publish this in the org zone, so that, or the .com zone or wherever, so that my domain will actually be delegated, signed from the registrar down to my domain. There's work going on in the ITF. Actually, the work in the ITF is done but the registrars are gradually adopting a technology that lets you advertise, please, please, I'm signed, please import my, my DS records. Uh, you know, here they are published in my zone already. Uh, and then later you can, in fact, once you're already signed, you can say, here are my new DS records, and you publish them in your own DNS, and, and instead of going back to the registry and typing in stuff into a web UI and you know, having cut and paste errors and so on, you can automate your key rollover through a communications channel uh, that's built into the DNS, but most many of the registrars have not adopted this. It's still early days, only a few support uh, these CDS records. So you, you paste in your DS records manually. Uh, sorry, what's the called? CDS, uh, yes. And CDS0 lets you expire your DS records, and CDS lets you publish them. So you can read all about that. Yeah, uh, right. Right, yes, so we're getting past the APIs and a few of the registries and Cloudflare is pushing hard on this, is to uh, ramp up support for CDS. So naturally one would want to back up one's uh, service time keys? Uh, no, because you can always introduce a new one. It's the KS case that you care about. That's what I mean. Sorry. Uh, oh, it, it, right, right, yeah. Yes, definitely. Uh, you, you, you don't want to lose those, although, of course, if you have a, a registrar login account that you can still log into in an emergency, you can always generate new KSKs and you know publish the new DS, but you might then have a brief outage because it's hard to synchronize the zone signing with the appearance of the new DS records. So if you lose your KSKs and your zone starts to expire and you're unable to introduce new ones quickly enough, uh, you have a problem, uh, which we'll talk about that. Uh, so uh, ZSK rollover, uh, you can roll over your keys. Um, the only piece of advice I have on that is uh, a good piece of advice I got from somebody else. Don't configure your keys to pre-expire. You don't know whether or not at the date that you had intended to expire your keys, uh, the, the thing you expected to happen in terms of re-signing will or won't happen. So the idea is to generate your keys with an indefinite lifetime and to expire them actively as you're generating the replacement keys not a month in advance. Because some people can figure their keys and say, you know, I'm going to replace them in a month's time. The, sorry, they'll, they'll, they'll be gone after a month. But then if you don't follow them up with new zone signing keys, you lose. So whatever's on this slide, and you may be able to get those slides later, I'll, I'll probably uh, send them to, uh, to the organizers and they can distribute it or put it on the website. Uh, uh, the, the one lesson here is uh, do just-in-time expiration, not in advance expiration. Okay. Um, some DNSSEC best practice. Um, so uh, the first thing is that there is some friction to very large packet sizes on the internet, reportedly especially over IPv6. If you have IPv6 and you have IPv6 name servers, IPv6 does not fragment packets in the network. If you want to send a large you know, IPv6 datagram and at some comp at some, somewhere along the path the MTU is too small, it's just going to get dropped. Nobody's going to fragment it for you. Uh, you might get an ICMP message that got dropped, and then it's up to you to retransmit the packet. TCP will retransmit the packet. UDP, uh, often nobody's home to try and transmit the packet again. You know, you sent the packet to UDP, hey, you know, too bad if it didn't arrive. And it's UDP packets that tend to need fragmentation. Um, now, of course, if your MTU is correct at the outset, uh, then great, you know, you'll, you'll have fragmented the packet. But it turns out that some, some IPv6 routers also don't even deliver, you know, pre-fragmented packets correctly. There's an extended header in IPv6, and some of them don't support it. Uh, that's required for fragmentation. So IPv6 
and fragmentation don't play nice. And the minimum, the minimum required IPv6 MTU is 1280 bytes. Uh, very conservative number. We know that in practice, you know, most links are about 1500, but you can get multiple layers of various kinds of encapsulations with IPsec tunnels and PPP and this and that and so on. So they did an awful lot of subtracting from 1500, somehow arrived at 1280. Uh, and then that 1280 is the IPv6 MTU, but the IPv6 still has a 40-byte header, and UDP has an 8-byte header, and various other things have headers. Um, and so in practice, what it means is that you as a name server for, of IPv6 who is willing to deliver you know, large, larger than the original DNS 512-byte limit packet uh, to, your, to your resolvers, uh, should probably not promise them any more than about 1,216 bytes. Uh, anything larger than that is likely to run into fragmentation barriers, and your DNS might prove unreliable for some clients, depending on the path MTU between you and them. Uh, so even though eDNS buffer sizes, by default in many, in many software implementations, are 4K, 4K is probably too large. We should probably be using eDNS sizes of around 1,200 bytes and letting everything else get truncated and fail over to TCP. Uh, another reason to keep your DNS packets small is try and keep them under 1,200 bytes. By the way, I did some measurements on the root zone and found that almost everything of interest that the root zone returns conveniently falls just short of about 1,200 bytes. Uh, so whether that's a coincidence or not, uh, the root zone doesn't have much of a barrier for IPv6 delivery because their packets are small enough. You might want to emulate their... Uh, uh, their settings. Uh, I do recommend algorithm 13. Uh, it leads to smaller packets, which are more likely to get delivered over IPv6 and less likely to get abused in amplification attacks. Uh, if you're using RSA, the, you know, the, the algorithm 8 is RSA with SHA-256. That seems to be the most popular one that makes sense to use for RSA. Your key signing keys, uh, many people, you know, do 2048. It's perfect, you know, that, that's best practice in, in HTTPS and so on. I would recommend something slightly smaller. 1536 is plenty secure for DNSSEC, uh, substantially more secure than RSA 1024, but keeps the packet sizes more modest. Similarly with ZSKs, I, you know, 1024 bit is starting to look a little dodgy. 1280 is, is a substantial improvement. There are, in fact, uh, there's a, a non-trivial fraction of domains who use 1280 byte ZSKs. They're not the majority, the majority use 1024, but 1280 is a, is a good place to be for ZSK key sizes. Uh, the Bernstein curves, uh, ED 25519 and ED 448, are just now appearing in bleeding edge open SSL releases. Uh, almost no resolvers are compiled and linked with them. So if you publish that as your DNS signing key, you will look unsigned because there's no algorithm compatibility to most resolvers. So at this time, while well, you should start have your um, resolvers start to support these key types, your name service should not yet sign with uh, uh, elliptic curve, uh, at, at, at DSA elliptic curves, because almost nobody will be able to uh, recognize these as valid signatures. And finally, uh, automate your zone signing. Signature lifetime, not one year, as, in, as is the case in some cases, but keep your signatures about seven to 30 days. Um, if you try and push your signatures much lower, you, run, you potentially run into issues with slave servers that might, in fact, uh, not receive your data quickly enough, and they might have expired data by the time they've actually managed to obtain a slave copy from the, from the master, plus the TTL. So there's a kind of a practical limit on how short your dynastic signatures can be uh, if they're much less than seven days, you need to have very reliable slave servers that are carefully monitored and uh, either deliver data that is just only a few hours old uh, or are taken out of service uh, if they're unable to receive data from the, uh, from the primaries. Because once the slave server falls a few days behind the primary, if your signature lifetimes are short, it might be serving expired signatures. So, um, yeah. Okay. So that was uh, kind of an overview of what's going on in DNSSEC. Uh, just a little bit of history. Uh, this game really start, even though the standards have been under development a lot longer, practical interest in deployment began around 2008 when Dan Kaminsky validated uh, another Dan, Dan Bernstein's claims 
that DNS was too easy to spoof uh, by demonstrating how easy it was, in fact. People thought it was harder, but in fact, uh, Bernstein was right. Uh, and so he did this at Black Hat, and there was a big reaction. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, a port randomization was added to DNS servers, sort of cryptographically strong, unpredictable source ports for queries. Uh, and um, uh, th that was already in DJB DNS, but it wasn't a feature of bind at the time, but it was added. And then shortly after, that org got signed in 2009. ICANN signed in 2010. The rootzone.com got signed in 2011. And most of the other GTLDs have followed. Uh, only one remains of Arrow, and I'm told it's likely to get signed next year. Uh, as its contract comes up for renewal, ICANN will enforce the new terms, and all the GTLDs have to be signed. Uh, the country level, uh, top level domains are not obligated by any rules of ICANN. They, they are sort of independently chartered. They have their domain by virtue of being the country, not by virtue of registering with ICANN. ICANN cannot deregister Canada or France or whatever. They get to be Canada or France even if ICANN doesn't exist. Uh, and so uh, of those, only about half are, are, are signed at the moment. Uh, most of the ones kind of the, the, we in this room care about, you know, the, the developed economies and so on, have signed TLD domains, and the ones that are unsigned are, you know, various, various Pacific islands and smaller nations and so on, uh, aren't signed. Uh, but still, you know, only half of the country level domains are signed at the moment. Okay. Uh, so, um, in terms of, uh, you know, best practice, finally, when you deploy DNSSEC, no matter how well you automate, uh, you really have to monitor. If you don't monitor, eventually something will go wrong. You won't notice it until your domain is out, and then and then some some, some somebody will uh, uh, poo poo this whole DNS sec thing about how unreliable it is. It's such a terrible risk. Uh, anything that's automated, you know, can fail if not properly maintained. Uh, DNS sec requires a little bit more maintenance, but proper planning. You know, means that you're, you're going to be on top of it. Uh, you will check that your signatures are not near expiration well before they're about to expire, not minutes before, but days before. You know, if, you're, if your resigning software is working properly, nothing will ever get too close to expiration. So look for that, monitor, monitor that all your name servers are working, they're all returning correctly signed data, and that none of it is too near expiration. Uh, make sure that you don't have firewalls that uh, uh, foolishly block certain record types. Uh, there are uh, uh, certain devices that, in fact, as a software defect, used to block certain record types that they didn't recognize. It wasn't intended behavior, yes? Um, it's usually the Cisco's that do that, so turn that shit off, and also um, don't block ICMP. Right. Um, PathMTU discovery is important, but, but some, some machines do in fact block CAA, TLSA, CDS, and all of that. CAA you know, uh, gets in the way if you're ever getting certificates from Let's Encrypt, if that's blocked. Uh, TLSA means you might not get mail, and so on. So make sure your, your firewalls are not interfering with the proper operation of DNS. Um, and uh, rotate your keys periodically. I would say key signing keys every year or two, you know, depending on your security requirements. Zone signing keys, 90 days to, tends to be a popular uh, time to rotate your keys, but you know, slightly longer if your security needs are not quite so strong. <laughs> on the resolver side, um, make sure that your resolution of the root domain works correctly, that the root domain looks secure from the point of view of your resolver. Uh, make sure uh, that the, the trust anchor rollover can work, although it's hard to make sure, given that they happen so infrequently. So what you should really be looking for are all the file permissions correct, kind of analyze your configuration, go through the thought experiment of how rollover would work on your machine and make sure there are no major barriers. Make sure that the start scripts on your machine that roll over the, uh, the root signing keys are run once the network's already up. The only, you know, one of the uh, fallouts from last week's uh, key rollover, there were so few problems, but somebody reported their home router stopped working because it always did the key, the key updates before the network was up. Uh, so they always failed. So it never, it never saw the new keys. Uh, and um, uh, finally, 
Uh, do turn on validation in your resolver. You will protect yourself from all the various DNS hijacking attacks. And um, uh, also, uh, in some cases, uh, certainly for me with my Dane survey, or if you have a very high volume you know, a name server that's serving a lot of clients on a big network, uh, and you might even increase your privacy a little bit that way. Slave copies of the root NARPA zones are available for anybody. C come and get them. Uh, there's even an RFC describing how to do it. The B root has even, you know, a little bit more information, might send you notifications when the root zone changes and so on. So you can have your own private copies of the root zone, and then you're not dependent on the root name servers. You're only dependent on .com and below. Um, so you can get those zones. Uh, all right, and, and enough checklists about DNS. I should probably uh, uh, skip uh, skip this slide. Uh, this is important. Don't do what this domain is doing. Uh, they modify their SOA record after the zone is signed. So all of their negative answers with the SOA record are always bogus. Bogus is what DNS calls responses whose signatures don't validate. Uh, so they, they sign their zone and, ah, okay, we're, we're, we've just changed the zone. We must now change the SOA record, right? Well, slightly the wrong order. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can use DNS viz to find and, you know, avoid such mistakes. So let me tell you a little bit about um, uh, what's going on in DNSSEC. Um, there are, uh, I've surveyed about 250 million domains uh, in part by having authoritative copies of, it, of .com and .net and .org and various other things, so I can find the signed domains without trying every other domain because I have the list. Uh, but sometimes also by getting uh, incomplete lists and you know uh, testing live to see whether something is signed or not. And I found nine million DNSSEC domains. Uh, uh, some people find are surprised by that number. It's actually not a bad fraction. Uh, nine out of 250 million were, you know, we're not yet the majority of domains, but it's it's getting there. We're we're on our way. Um, about 10 million estimated. I'm missing half a million Brazilian domains that probably all parked, which is why I'm not finding them. Uh, and ECDSA is already fairly popular. Out of the nine million domains, 20% are using ECDSA. Uh, all right. Who's doing DNSSEC? The answer is Northern Europe, especially Holland. One third of the NSX domains I found are in Holland. Uh, uh, you see a lot of other European countries. Really, the only exception to it being a Northern European game is Brazil is the outlier. And then .com uh, is where all of the not Northern European actions happen. So certainly there are, you know, a reasonable number of U.S. organizations with DNSSEC, but they all hide under .com. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, I'll. Uh, I'll mostly skip this slide except for uh, one notable surprising thing is that if you're looking for TLDs where DNSSEC is especially reliable, where all the DNSSEC domains are working, none of them return incorrect answers even when parked, Hong Kong has no DNSSEC failures at all. Every single domain, especially the Chinese Hong Kong. Uh, the English, whatever, the uh, ASCII Hong Kong has a 0.06% failure rate a little bit behind Brazil. On the other hand, uh, dot .bank, 41% uh, failure rate. Uh, uh, um, not, not, not much more to say about it, except that, of course, uh, dot .bank, uh, as I described to their CEO, actually, who I met at MOG uh, uh, recently, dot .bank looks to me like a swampy parking lot. Uh, and uh, they're going to try and do something about that. So maybe over the next month or so, uh, a lot of these domains will start working. But at the moment, you just, you just register your trademark and then you ignore the domain. Uh, uh, I don't know what's going on in Russia or in RW, but again, DNSSEC is not uh, terribly effective there. Okay, uh, I can take brief q and I'm running behind schedule. I want to tell you a little bit about Dane. Uh, but if there are questions about DNSSEC before we move on to Dane, uh, by all means, or we can just move on because I'm behind schedule. Yes? Okay, we're moving along. Yes? Okay. Uh, 
Uh, yes, it's possible, but I won't, EDNS zero is extremely well supported now. Uh, very few resolvers don't handle EDNS zero. So I don't think you need to aim for under 512. You should aim for under 1200. However, uh, ECDSA signatures are 512 bits. If you do the arithmetic, that works out to 64 bytes per signature. So you can stuff a certain, you know, a reasonable number of those into a 512 byte response. So if you have your ordinary records, and let's say four, four RR sets appear in your answer, let, let's say denial of existence with NSEC3. So then you're paying 256 bytes of signature overhead. And if the rest of the data fits into the other 256, you're under 512. With RSA, you don't really stand a chance. Uh, okay, great. Um, the, the only thing is it's, it's not actually the resolvers or the authoritatives we worry about with the 512. It's actually uh, the middle boxes and a few of the stub resolvers. So. Okay. All right. Dane. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about email security and how it ties into uh, this wonderful world of DNSSEC. So um, in email, uh, we have a pretty good security story, right? Um, the, uh, the sender uses submission. Uh, you've all used you know, mail clients with submission. You configure TLS. You tell it what server to connect to. It'll do TLS. It'll authenticate it. Uh, the TLS won't be, won't be vulnerable to stripping because your client will enforce it. We can send email securely to our submission server. Uh, when you're receiving email, you configure your IMAP client, you tell it to do, you tell it to do TLS. Uh, for, for IMAP, it'll authenticate the IMAP server, it'll receive your email over secure channel. Presto magic, we now have secure email because we can send securely and receive securely, right? Uh, well, there's a bit of a gap in the middle there. Uh, and uh, so uh, 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 a miracle happens, and the email somehow makes it from the left side to the right side, and you know we have secure delivery. Uh, well, uh, as uh, as a famous T-shirt, or you know, you might have seen before, uh, I, you know, she might be more explicit here in step two. It's a Sydney Harris cartoon. If anybody is looking for it, it's a good one, well known. So uh, what actually happens in step two is opportunistic start TLS. Your organization's email server, when, when talking to another organization's email server, will try to encrypt when possible. Uh, it will not authenticate the other organization's mail server as a rule. Uh, and will send in the clear if the other mail server appears to not support start TLS. Uh, but the signal that it supports or doesn't support start TLS is easily stripped by, by a man in the middle attacker. So uh, on the other hand, we have some good news. Um, the good news is that perhaps because of, or rather than despite of these weaknesses, the adoption rate for encryption in email is actually higher than on the web. Uh, today, approximately 92% of traffic uh, from Gmail or to Gmail, well, you know, whatever, uh, is used to start TLS. Uh, so in HTTP, it only recently crossed 50%, and now I believe it's in the 70s, but still ramping up. Um, email's ahead, and in part because it's easier to do opportunistic start TLS, uh, which degrades to clear text without bothering anybody, uh, than uh, to do you know, on the web you know, proper, proper certificate management and so on. So uh, email, by virtue of asking for less, uh, does it more of the time. Uh, I actually have an RFC about that, RFC 7435. Uh, it's called opportunistic security, uh, some, some security most of the time, or something like that. Uh, you can read it. It's, it's a sort of a good rationale for why opportunistic security isn't always a bad idea, and sometimes, in fact, is the right thing to do. Uh, so, so that's the story. We have sort of best effort security, but uh, we might be able to do better. But before we can do better, we need to understand that people who sort of criticize email security, you know, on the basis of, well, you know, it should be just like HTTPS, are kind of missing the story. And the story is that email is very different. Email fundamentally relies on MX record in direction, which puts it at the mercy of DNS security. So you cannot apply the same security analysis to SMTP that you can apply to HTTPS. And the WebCA 
trust for you know the certificate bundles that you get from Mozilla and so on are a bit more problematic for for email because in the case of a browser with a user sitting behind it, when you occasionally get certificate validation errors, but you're going to a site that's showing you the weather and you don't give a damn, you can click through and say OK. But email is sent in the background by automated systems. There's nobody to click OK. If authentication fails, the mail doesn't go through. So we need to have much more reliable, trustworthy authentication signals if we're going to hard fail on them. And so, uh, and also, therefore, we're going to trust every single CA we're going to lay our hands on, because otherwise the mail might not go through. But by the time we've trusted every single CA, um, you know, but who, what, what exactly are we getting? Um, so, so in email, the web PKI is not so well suited as it is to HTTPS. One can argue even as to whether it's well suited to HTTPS, but that's a whole different discussion. Uh, so uh, what we'd like to do for email um, is uh, to be able to encrypt whenever, whenever possible. Um, and especially, uh, you know, I often hear, well, why, you know, are, th are there really attacks out there? Do I need to worry? You know, why, why would we want more than opportunistic star TLS? You know, is anybody attacking my traffic? And my view is it's a little bit like herd immunity. You know, people may not be attacking your traffic today. They might attack it tomorrow. They might attack somebody else's traffic. Maybe you don't care about the security of what you're sending, but maybe the person replying to you cares about the security of what they send back. So if encryption is there and security is there always, then it's always there when needed. Trying to figure out when it's needed and when it's not is not so easy. So my argument is that we should try and in fact, provide a secure mail delivery channel on always by default. Whether or not in any given email transmission, it is actually critically needed or not. So uh, I'd like to be able to provide more than opportunistic star TLS and resist active attacks. And uh, I'd like to also be able to resist these active attacks even when sending email to a domain I've never sent to before, if at all possible. Uh, and uh, the signal that a domain really supports strong authentication should not be uh, uh, should, should should be present, so I can tell uh, who I need to uh, encrypt to and who is not ready for it yet. Uh, and it, I should be able to reliably authenticate without having to trust every CA on the planet. So for this, uh, uh, we uh, we have a standard called Dane. Uh, it was something that that I was pointed at in 2013 by Tony Finch who's one of the sort of Exim developers, but also a uh, very active in the DNS standards community. And he sent me an email in something like February of 2013 saying, hey, you postfix guys, why aren't you doing Dane yet? Uh, and I had been doing a lot of work in TLS and, and you know, in postfix, and I took a look at it, and it seemed like a pretty good fit, the fit for, for email security, so I started working on it. And then it turned out that the Exim guys weren't actually doing anything in that space, really, but, but they goaded me into taking action so I ended up writing the RFC and implementing it in Postfix and OpenSSL. Uh, so, and the timing was good because I did this work in March and you know, April and May of 2013, and then something interesting happened in June of 2013. Uh, a, certain, a certain guy who's still hiding in Moscow from the feds at the moment uh, came along and, and broke some news stories that made it much more interesting for people to start adopting uh, encryption on the internet. Uh, and so, uh, and so here we are, and, and especially in uh, in Germany and various other places, uh, uh, this resonated with them, and they became early adopters uh, of Dane for email. Um, okay, so uh, so uh, so Dane uh, does a few things for email. Uh, it uh, avoids star TLS stripping. The publication of Dane TLSA record says, "I promise to do TLS." So therefore, if you don't see star TLS from me, something's wrong. It guards against MX record forgery mere, merely by virtue of the fact that Dane is based on DNSSEC, and DNSSEC prevents MX record forgery. And it authenticates the, the, uh, the domain via DNSSEC so that instead of having hundreds of CAs that might independently try to uh, tell the truth or lie or whatever about, uh, about which keys are appropriate for your domain, uh, you're, you, there's a much smaller number of players who can speak for the validity of your domain's keys, and that is your domain, your parent domain, the root, basically only up the DNS tree. A small number of parties you can't avoid by, but trust. 
if they control your DNS, they are your domain. I'm sorry. So if the feds have seized your domain, they will receive mail for your domain. Uh, so uh, these are the players who you can't avoid trusting, and they're exactly the ones who you trust. Uh, OK. Uh, so since then, um, these are you know, 100 or so domains that you know, are actually appear on Google's email transparency report. They're large enough that Google includes them in that report. They tend not to report domains that send less traffic. Even to Sigma isn't considered large enough. They don't appear in a transparency report. So these guys might be slightly larger. And some of the ones in bold you might recognize. There's you know, Debian.org and NetBSD.org and OpenSSL.org and, uh, and so on. And there are some uh, Germany uh, large providers, GMX.d and Web.d have tens of millions of customers in Germany. Uh, and there's the Brazilian registrar and so on. Uh, uh, Posteo was one of the early adopters who decided to do Dane you know, pretty early on, uh, either 2014 or I think perhaps 2015. Mid-2015, some of these folks came along. Uh, so Dane has seen some adoption by larger domains, but at the moment still, Dane is largely adopted by a small number of hosters who host hundreds of thousands of domains between them, uh, and smaller you know, enthusiasts like this, like this crowd who deploy it for themselves. But there are, there are already uh, some larger organizations, and tens of millions of users are covered. Um, this is the adoption story. Uh, I'm showing here how many organizations have a MEX hosts with Dane turned on. So what we're seeing is growth from 2016 to the present, where it looks kind of linear to me, where by now we have around 3,600 organizations in which MEX hosts have TLSA records supporting Dane. Uh, back then, it was around 1,800 uh, two years ago. Uh, OK. Uh, how do we uh, deploy Dane? Um, the main barrier to Dane deployment is getting your DNSSEC up and running. If you don't have DNSSEC, you can't do Dane. Uh, so do DNSSEC. Uh, once that's done, the rest is fairly easy, but there's one thing that some people struggle with, which is how to coordinate their TLSA records with uh, changing certificates and keys on their system as they roll their keys, especially with Let's Encrypt. I'm going to describe how to make this easier. So uh, for inbound Dane, which is email arriving to you, it turns out that your mail server does not need any Dane-specific modifications. It just needs to support start TLS and have certificates that match whatever it is that's published in DNSSEC. So you have your MTA. It needs to support TLS. Uh, its MX records need to be signed. That's work you do in DNS. Its DNSSEC signed TLSA records that I'll talk about soon uh, are also work you do in DNS. If your um, email is outsourced to a provider, so your MX records point at you know, some provider, most likely in Europe, if they're going to have Dane working, uh, then the provider can enable Dane. You don't have to do anything. You just point your MX records there. Um, I'm told that one of these days soon, uh, the uh, protonmail.ch is planning to do Dane. They haven't rolled it out. They're a little bit slow, but they said they'll do it. When they do it, if your mail domain, you know, if paying them money to host your email, uh, uh, point your MX records there. They'll do the Dane bits for you. All you have to do is maintain DNSSEC. On the other hand, if you're running your own mail server, then you have to uh, hear more of what I have to say soon in terms of managing your own uh, Dane records in DNS. Um, outbound Dane is much easier. Uh, outbound Dane, all you need is a validating resolver, local to the MTA, so that you can do the validation in your resolver and not in the MTA software. Uh, doing DNSSEC validation in each client application despite folks who say that that's the way to do it is too cumbersome and too likely to lead to stale trust anchors and various other problems or ancient algorithms that are not properly updated. The DNS resolvers are much better at doing DNSSEC than application libraries you're likely to link into. Um, so uh, run a local resolver on the MTA. Pick an MTA that supports Dane. Postfix, XM, Halon, PowerMTA. Mail in a box that email provides a turnkey system that, that automates DNSSEC, automates Dane, automates DMARC, automates SPF, uh, uh, provides a DoveCut IMAP server. The whole thing, just all integrated works. 
If you want to op try operating your own mail server, but you don't have much cycles for figuring out how to integrate all technologies, you know, download mailinabox.email. It kind of gives you a virtual appliance. Install it. You're you're up and running. Um, uh, so that that's a cool thing to do. Uh, but even Cisco in their Ironport, formerly Ironport ESA appliance, is rolling out Dane. Uh, some, they're in beta, I think, now, and they'll soon be in production uh, in Ironport. Uh, turn on Dane per whatever instructions come with your MTA. It's fairly straightforward, but occasionally some domains will screw up their key rotation. Uh, I help curate a list of these at a GitHub page where you can download a, that, that list and integrate it as an exception list into your MTA. How do you Dane with Postfix? Well, uh, for receiving, you know, just do start TLS. Uh, and uh, make sure your TLSA records always match your certificate chain. Uh, and for sending, you configure only the three settings at the bottom, really. You set, you enable DNSSEC, you enable Dane, and you configure a TLS policy table that lets you make exceptions. All that stuff about DB type and CFGD or an index is just some macros that I use boilerplate to really to make stuff fit on the slide <laughs> more than anything else. Uh, but um, so that's a postfix, you know, turning on Dane in both directions fits on one screen, one slide. Uh, TLSA records, time to talk about what these are. So uh, there are only, there are 24 possible combinations of these three numbers that you see at the front of TLSA records. Only two of them are at all useful. So forget about all the others. If you see a TLSA record that's not a 311 or a 211, the person publishing it doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the 311 is your server's direct public key as a SHA-256 hash. So essentially 311 lets you pin your server's public key using SHA-256. The 211 is some issuer of your server certificate and their public key as a SHA-256 hash. You can publish either or both, or multiple TLSA records, so long as at least one matches, your domain authenticates. So uh, the rest of the record after the 211 or the 311 is the hash value. Uh, so when you see a Dane TLSA record, it'll be some domain in TLSA, three numbers, and some hexadecimal digits. The only three numbers you need to worry about are 311 and 211. Let's see about how we, how we actually manage these. The key thing about Dane is if everything is static, you can publish a single 311 record or a single 211 record, and so long as nothing ever changes on the internet, we freeze the world, uh, you're good forever. And so many people do just publish one TLSA record, and it works until something changes. The point is they haven't planned again they haven't planned ahead to the moment until something changes. So what I'm going to tell you is how to plan ahead. Uh, so the problem is that your TLSA records are cached in the DNS by various people who've looked them up before. You can't instantaneously change them on your server and have the change replicated throughout the whole internet the moment you change it. When you introduce a new certificate, some people will see the new TLSA records, some people will see the old TLSA records. Both need to match your new certificate, which necessarily implies that at least during that transition, you need to have two TLSA records in the DNS, one of which matches your previous certificate chain, and the other one matches your new certificate chain. If you're going to have two records some of the time, my claim is you should have two records all of the time. Always have a current record and an upcoming record so that during a transition, at least one will remain invariant while the other potentially changes. So we'll, I'll walk you through the details of that, but that's the basic philosophy. So we publish keys well in advance of obtaining the corresponding certificates. We already know that we have a TLSA record that's going to match them. I'm going to talk about two models. One of them publishes two 311 records, one for the current key, one for your upcoming key. The other model publishes your uh, server key and a key for its issuer. So that when you change your server key, the issuer key continues to validate your certificate chain. So let's explore these in a little more detail. First, the 311 model, where you publish your current key and the next key. 
So you generate your next key immediately as soon as you've deployed the current one. Let's say your rotate key is monthly. At the beginning of each month, whenever it is that you're doing it, you deploy whatever key you're going to deploy at the beginning of that month. The key that you're going to do next time, you know, 60 to 30, 60, now whatever, 90 days from now, you will generate it but not deploy it yet at that moment. When you've pre-generated it, you can immediately compute its TLSA record even before you've seen the certificate because the TLSA record pins the key, not the cert. When you've generated that, that, that TLSA record, you can publish it immediately. That's going to be a valid key at some point soon. So you say so in DNS. Then by the time 30 to 60 days out, you, it's time to obtain a new certificate. Your key has long been in place. It's in every single DNS cache. Your, your, your TTLs are not going to be 30 or 60 days. Therefore, when you do your key rollover, your TLSA record for the new key is already in place. You obtain a certificate for the next key. That becomes your live key. At that moment, you play the game again. You again generate the next key. You, you, you're always ahead in terms of TLSA records, well ahead of your actual key deployment. This model is robust. It, it lets you make sure that by the time you deploy your new certificate, you can check, gee, that TLSA record, it should have been there ages ago. If it's not, well, let's not deploy the new certificate chain. Something went wrong. Let's keep working with the old key that's still going to verify. Um, so with Let's Encrypt, I have a footnote there. Uh, the, the dash dash CSR option can be used to tell Let's Encrypt, no, no, don't generate a new key. Here's the, the CSR signed by the key that I want to use that's going to have the right domains in it, generate from that. Or you can use CertBot and tell it to, sorry, what? You know, in Let's Encrypt, you normally generate new keys. Keep my key stable. I want new certificates with the same key. The same key is good enough for me. I'm not, I don't have such security requirements that I want to roll my keys monthly. Maybe I only want to roll my keys once a year manually or something. So you can kind of put the problem aside and not have to go through TLSA record updates automatically in the background every month. So there are perhaps other models, but these two work fairly well. I have a mailbox with about 6,000 messages in it accumulated over the last four years, mostly informing Let's Encrypt users that they've screwed up key rotation. Uh, uh, so uh, the Let's Encrypt users who are publishing just one record most of them get it right, but a noticeable minority get it wrong, and they get it wrong repeatedly. They, uh, once, once you're on my list, you, you, you tend to stay on my list of people who keep getting notices. Uh, so don't be one of those people. Um, OK. Uh, the other model is to pin your issuer certificate. When you pin your issuer certificate or, or his public key, then when he gives you new certificates you know, periodically, his key tends to be much more stable than yours. And so you can rely on that to give you a new certificate that still verifies against the 211. You deploy it. At that moment, your 311 record might break. But your 211 will still validate. Automate some email or something that will then notice and say, after the fact, I only now have one TLSA record that works, not two. Let's bring the other one in, in, up, in sync, back in sync, and, and restore it back to two of them working. So you can kind of be a procrastinator and instead of proactively making a TLSA record that will match your key. Do it after the fact, updating whichever one just broke. On the other hand, if your issuer is about to change, then you have to be a little bit careful and, and go with the old key. If you notice that, that you're now getting a certificate from a new issuer, you have to retry and say, no, no, well, this time I'm not going to roll my key or something. So this is more complicated. It's also less secure because Let's Encrypt criteria for issuing certificates are pretty weak. I don't actually strongly recommend this model because cert bot and friends will you know, issue keys much too easily to all kinds of parties. Um, so, uh, but you can, however, do this with your own CA. If you operate your own in-house CA, uh, you can even keep the keys offline and you know, periodically issue them you know, on some sort of password. So uh, anyway, this is a viable model. It's a secondary model in my view. Go with the first one unless this one is particularly appealing to you. On the other hand, this is a little bit easier in some cases for people who just want to do cert bot stuff and, and are willing to trust Let's Encrypt. They want a modest amount of extra SMTP security. They don't want to be as secure as having all their keys pinned. Uh, so uh, what do you need to do to make sure Dane's running properly? Well, you have to automate your TLSA record updates and zone resigning. Uh, if you leave it to a manual process, you will screw up. 
at some point. Uh, so make sure that reliable scripts are either keeping your keys stable and doing all the rollovers in that model or rolling them over, but repeatedly and often enough so that you can have confidence that the process is reliable. If you only change keys every three years, you probably haven't practiced it well enough to make sure it works properly. Yes. Question as loud as you can. Uh, observation, be careful about checking the beginning or end of the month because the key's going down in bad moments. Yes. Uh, let's encrypt. I just spoke to Sydney Lee from, from EFF.org, who's one of the people working on, uh, on Let's Encrypt. And she also says, try not to run your cron job for Let's Encrypt at the same moment that everybody else is running it. Let's Encrypt apparently has a thundering herd problem where some of the operating systems that distribute CertBot have configured a fixed time of day at which everybody running CertBot runs it. Yes. Uh, uh, Yao, yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of other things we can talk about. So automate your key rollover. Uh, make sure you understand all these issues with CertBot. And also, if you're going to be doing Dane, uh, be reachable. Uh, if, you're, if, if people start being unable to send you email, they should be able to find the right contact, send them an email by some other uh, out-of-band means, uh, uh, and notify the, the domain administrator, postmaster, whatever. Mm -hmm. Without email? No, no. You, you could, I actually have an email ad a sender address that I use that's exempted from Dane policy in Postfix. So I will normally use Dane, but if I pick that sender address, the email uses a different transport, doesn't go over Dane. Uh, you know, or you can send it from Gmail or whatever. But, but the point is that the domain should have a working contact so that you can notify them and reestablish. If people hide uh, and make it very difficult to reach them and at the same time enable Dane, uh, they're, they're hurting themselves at times. And then, of course, monitoring. Uh, you really shouldn't deploy the stuff unless you're looking after it and monitoring it. I do want people to deploy Dane. I don't want them to think that it's something they fire and forget about and completely neglect and it's going to somehow magically keep working. Do monitor or don't deploy. Uh, monitor that your DNSSEC is working. Monitor that your start TLS is always working and available unconditionally, not just to people who have previously connected to you. Because if a Dane sender comes to you for the first time, they'll not ever you know, pr send you email to prove that they're good. So their reputation will never be positive in whatever anti-spam appliance you have. Uh, so there can be a little deadlock there. So start TLS needs to not be conditional. Uh, TLS error codes need to match your certificate chain. Check for that regularly. Uh, not just my survey. I will stop doing my survey when Dane adoption gets high enough. At the moment, I can still you know, daily connect to everybody who's doing Dane. At some point, I'll stop doing that. Uh, and some people have more than one certificate deployed. They support both CCDSA and RSA and they forget to check that Dane works for both of them. But the keys are different for ECDSA and RSA and have different hashes. So you actually need to check two, over two different algorithms, make two TLS connections to check that both are properly working. Uh, so as I said, 311 plus 311 is a good idea. Uh, use a separate certificate for each MX host. People with wild cer wildcard certs tend to deploy them simultaneously on all of their MX hosts, roll them all at once, if it breaks, you know, you can have 10 MX hosts, they all fail at the same time. Uh, the redundancy, not a good story there. And, and so stagger the certificate rotation. Even with different certificates, don't roll them all simultaneously on all your MX hosts. If you screw up, again, you have a total outage. Basics, you'd think it'd be obvious, but not to everybody. Uh, there are some tools you can use. Dane.sys4.e lets you punch in your domain name. And presto magic, it'll tell you whether uh, your domain works. There's a mailing list where you can ask questions. Uh, I'll probably be the one answering them. Uh, there's a hash slinger by Paul Woters of the sort of DNS working group in Red Hat and various other places. Uh, lets you generate TLSA records, check that yours are working, and so on. Uh, Phil Pennock, who's an XM developer, wrote something in the Go language uh, that uh, plugs into Nagios and whatever and can check whether your TLSA records match your certificate chain. It's probably the thing I'd recommend for monitoring your, your own uh, MTA deployment. Uh, I wrote something called DaneCheck, uh, but I ripped it out of the guts of my DNS survey uh, and made it be just a one-shot thing. But my Dane survey is written in Haskell. And most people didn't want to deploy a Haskell compiler just to build a small program for doing Dane checks. So it's not been a, you know, a raving success, 
but if you if you're willing to deploy a Haskell compiler, uh, you can you can you can run Dane check. It's pretty reliable, but uh, it hasn't been popular. Uh, we'll we'll get to your question at the end. Yes, uh, or you can actually do the checks with OpenSSL S client, provided you've got OpenSSL 1.1.0 or later. The OpenSSL S client utility, that little workhorse testing tool that that comes built in with OpenSSL, uh, on one page can verify uh, uh, the validity of your certificate chain. Basically, what we're doing, you know, in the middle of the screen, is we're running OpenSSL S client. I don't know where. Can we see my mouse anywhere? Uh, uh, Right, there's an OpenSLS client command in the middle, and it's running with all these options, start TLSSMTP, connect to some host, verify, verify, return error, brief, Dane, and all these Dane things that were added to S client back in 2017. So once you look up your TLSA records in with dig, you can pump them into an appropriate S client command, and it will verify the validity uh, of your Dane certificate chain. In fact, I can even do, uh, with any luck, uh, a little, actually, ah, then uh, doing the live demo is a little too complicated while this is running, so never mind. But um, uh, later I can show you on my terminal uh, that this actually works. So here we see a connection to mail.itf.org, and we see that OpenSSL reports verification OK, and that we matched the, the certificate for mail.itf.org, and the exit status of the command is zero. It would have been non-zero if the Dane verification failed. So this is a pretty short shell script, or, you know, a little function. Uh, so it's not that hard to do Dane verification. Uh, all right. Uh, this is a little slide on people who have DNSSEC but don't have Dane. You'd think that you don't have to do anything for Dane, but it turns out that you do, because as soon as you have DNSSEC, Dane-enabled MTAs are going to try and discover your TLSA records and fail to deliver mail if the discovery fails. It'll look like a downgrade attack. So when you have DNSSEC, make sure the denial of existence when you don't have TLSA records actually works for your domain. If when I ask you for your TLSA records and you're signed and you say, oh, I don't know, or here's an invalid proof, uh, I'm not going to deliver mail to you. So uh, Dane is the first protocol that required denial of existence to work properly in DNSSEC uh, for, for, for application data, not just for the DS records. Uh, and this, uh, this used to be broken in various hosting you know, implementations that wrote their own name servers. The denial of existence was buggy. Um, it still is buggy on a very tiny scale. About 500 domains out of my 9 million that I'm monitoring have broken denial of existence. That's a fairly tiny fraction, but they exist. Don't be among them. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, so again, don't have firewalls that filter. You can test whether your name server has these problems. Look up uh, example.com, if that's your domain, for a record with type 12345. That's not a DNS type that anybody has registered or knows about. That query should return either no data if example.com exists or NX domain if it doesn't. Uh, it should not return any kind of failure. It should have a valid response demonstrating the non-existence or existence of the domain without those records. And there's a draft about that that uh, that's kind of working its way through the ITF very slowly. Uh, unfortunately, the author makes it a little bit difficult to adopt that draft because you get some strident language in there about unregistering domain names that fail and so on that nobody wants to touch. Uh, and so while his ideas are good, his advice as to what to do about noncompliance is, is not so tolerable. So the draft lingers on. Uh, but read it anyway. It's good stuff. Uh, so uh, I have a survey. It's written in Haskell uh, uh, because uh, Haskell can do concurrent network programming reliably uh, without, you know, by the time it compiles, it works. Uh, and for complicated software, that's a pretty good feature. It's not easy to write, but it's hard to get wrong. So I'm optimizing for hard to get wrong. Uh, so it monitors the domains delegated from public suffixes, everything under .com, everything under .co.uk that I can get my hands on, various country TLDs, and so on. From various sources, I get some from ICANN, some from VeriSign, some from Fireside Security, Paul Vixie, uh, some from the Dutch registry, and so on. Uh, and so I think I've collected around about 250 million candidate domain names to see if they have DNSSEC. As I mentioned, about 9 or 10 million of them do. Uh, and I capture all their DS records and DNS key records and MX and A and Quad A and so on, store them in a database, analyze them, 
uh, and out comes the, uh, the DNS Agdain adoption survey. Uh, 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 presently, 8.9 million domains with DNSSEC validated MX records, 323,000 domains that actually have all their primary MX hosts DAIN enabled. So that's pretty good. We have, you know, uh, a healthy number of domains doing DAIN. Tens of millions of users. As I said, five and a half thousand, you know, MX hosts in a, in a bunch of zones. And as I said, 500 domains with t TLSA denial of existence problems. 250 domains that are the ones that periodically, you know, get, get nagging emails from me. You've screwed up your key rotation. Uh, so there's sort of, uh, and some of them have been on that list for a long time. They never fix, they, despite the notifications. They don't care uh, presently. Maybe these domains aren't even used for email. They're just there for other purposes, and the, the email is enabled but not used. I don't know. But in any case, uh, the last thing I wanted to say is that there is this competing standard that Google and Yahoo and Microsoft and various others are promoting that's uh, email security for the DNSSEC challenged. Uh, the DNSSEC challenged includes Google and the like, understandably so. They have massive uh, geo load balancing DNS kit, right, on a scale we can't even dream of that doesn't really support DNSSEC at present and it would be hard to deploy it there. In order to deploy D a Dane for email, they really have to host their email servers on a different domain than the one they use for their web platform. Some of them do, some of them don't. Uh, so Google is actually starting to move their MX hosts from .google.com to .googleemail.com and that they might be able to sign at some point. Microsoft has Outlook.com for email, which they don't use for web, so they could do it at some point. Yahoo, well, you know, who cares about Yahoo? Uh, uh, and um, so, uh, so, so they have this other spec, and the spec is much weaker. Uh, so if you, if you implement both and, and Dane fails, you shouldn't then proceed to the other one. It's a downgrade. Don't trust MTASDS when Dane is, when Dane is published. Uh, however, uh, when you only have MTASTS, by all means, it's better than nothing. Uh, it, uh, Dane STS re MTASTS relies on the usual CA model. So to the extent that it's trivial to obtain through BGP hijack or whatever certificates for any domain of your choice, it falls victim to that. It also is insecure on first contact. It's a, it's a trust and first use kind of model. So it fails. After that, it, it pins and renews the stuff and so on but it, it, it's weak at first contact. Uh, and it's, a it's very complicated. Uh, it's a combination of DNS text records and HTTPS policy retrieval and MTA TLS uh, over SMTP. All of these things are kind of smashed together into a rather complicated standard. So uh, I don't recommend it, but uh, it'll probably get used as soon as it's up and running between Google and, and, and Microsoft and Yahoo. Uh, it'll deliver a heck of a lot more mail than all of my Dane domains put together uh, because you're just between these giants. The, small, the, the many smaller domains that are currently doing Dane will not outvolume this crowd. Uh, but hopefully in 2019, 2020, even that crowd will start gradually moving towards Dane, especially under pressure from Northern Europe. OK, that's all I have. Uh, so uh, we still have some time for Q&A, I believe. I guess maybe I sh if people want me to go back to some slide, I should probably restart this, and we can go back to some slide or something. Uh, first off, thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. Um, got two questions. The first is, uh, a couple of years back, I haven't been following it, following it so closely lately, but um, I know that in some of the production releases of Firefox and Chrome, et cetera, there was experimental Dane yes. support, and I think in some cases you had to you know, explicitly enable it. Um, and then I, I think that might have gone away at some point. What are you hearing right now as far as uh, in the in the browser community, uh, support for Dane. Is okay, so uh, first of all, about those experimental plugins, uh, they were demo toys. Don't trust your security to proof of concept demos. So it's a good thing they went away. I reviewed the code of a number of them. They were completely insecure. Uh, it's a good thing they're gone. If the Dane is to make it into browsers, it's to be properly designed, integrated, and supported as part of the browser design. So when it happens. 
it'll be a standard browser feature, not some third-party plugin of questionable quality. So uh, I'd like to actually punt this question to, uh, to Daniel Khan Gilmore sitting over there. Uh, <laughs> put him on the spot. Uh, Dane in browsers. Um, I'm not sure why I would be the one to answer that question. Oh, well, because of the DNSSEC chain extension yeah, so, uh, so that I believe is a prerequisite for Dane in browsers. Uh, it, so I don't think it's a prerequisite, actually. Uh, Victor, sorry, the back the backstory here. Victor's uh, putting me on the spot because we're in a discussion right now about um, a TLS extension that will move Dane records into the TLS handshake, so that the DNS records required to validate uh, a Dane chain don't need to be fetched over port 53, but can actually happen in band in the TLS communication. Right. Um, this solves the last mile problem. For <coughs> right. DNSSEC. It, it means that it means that if your de your delivery of DNSSEC data is failing because of the network, it doesn't matter because it's all happening in band in the existing TLS handshake. Um, so uh, I don't think that that's a prerequisite for uh, Dane in browsers because browsers are moving into a direction of actually being able to fetch DNS over much more reliable channels than UDP, uh, and that's due to the DNS privacy work that's been done. Um, so that, there will be a separate channel for fetching Dane-style records for the browsers that don't require the, the handshake. Although they still complain about latency and may not want to. There may, there may well be latency concerns, but, uh, but in terms of getting the records, the, they have other ways of getting them now. Right. Um, or they will by the time any of this is available. Um, but I do agree with Victor that, the, uh, that this is the sort of thing that really does need to be integrated tightly to the browser. Um, and not as a as an add-on extension. You know, most most security add-on extensions that we see are sort of band-aids over, uh, you know, broken bones, and that's not like a great way to to design things. Yeah, yeah. No, I was actually under the impression that some, at least the work that I was looking at, this was at least maybe three years back, was actually part of the browser build and was not a, a plugin or anything of that nature. Uh, there was, but it's still kind of not really maintained by the browser developers, right? There was a, a rebranded Firefox. I forget what its name was. Uh, huh? Yeah, some, some sort of dog name or something. There, there, there was uh, a Firefox that uh, somebody attempted to do it. And then CZ Nick, who mostly know what they're doing, had a plugin that wasn't too awful. But I still think none of this stuff was really, really had legs and was going to survive. Hmm. Uh, we'll see what happens with browsers. And there's also other things besides browsers that could maybe take advantage of Dane and would need the, definitely need the, uh, the DNSSEC chain extension. Uh, we're having quite a, an interesting discussion about that. So we're not ready yet to promise you anything in this space. Uh, no, um, NNTP, IMAP, POP. You know, other things use TLS and also find themselves in locations where the last mile problem is an issue. And it would be nice if one could uniformly uh, do Dane uh, in environments where the application may not, you know, be willing to run DNS over HTTP, uh, uh, over HTTPS or DNS over TLS, uh, and yet still may want to consume Dane. But anyway, um, so I don't have an answer for you. It's still some time away. SMTP is the only game in town at the moment for Dane. There, there was some early support in XMPP. I don't know where those folks have gone. Matt Miller and others did some early Dane work on XMPP. But XMPP, unfortunately, is a dying protocol, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the monolithic you know, IM providers have killed XMPP, and they're trying their best to kill email. Federation is not in their interest. Uh, let's not let them kill email. Resist. Yeah, we must. <laughs> um, so the second question is, um, and, and this is maybe something that's better suited for the bar. If you want to discuss it there, that's fine. But um, you, you know, a lot of the time when I read about DNSSEC implementation, um, you, you get this advice of uh, just don't do split horizon. And that sort of comes across as a little bit elitist, um, at least from the perspective of you know someone who's operating a you know small or or mid-sized network or even a home network where you don't have provider-independent IP address prefixes. Right. Um, what what are your thoughts on that matter? Um, so I have never had to operate such an environment, so I don't know about the reliability of the tools. 
Uh, Pavel might actually be able to tell you a little bit more. I think, uh, Pavel, are you trying to do Split Horizon at all with DNSSEC? On the, does Infoblock support it? Is he here? He went home. Uh, so it should work. Uh, uh, it, it's basically, you know, just you have multiple zones, but the one name server, and it figures out which one to serve to which clients, right? Uh, or to which network interface. Um, uh, the, the only thing is, you know, the keys published to the parent have to be properly understood, and on each side you have to know which trust anchors are in use. If you want to have different trust anchors on the two sides of the split horizon, it probably makes it a little bit more complicated. But if it's the same set of keys in for your zone, regardless of which view it's in, uh, you're not too badly off. Data in principle could leak from one side to the other and then look bogus to the other side. Uh, I think that's not very likely in most cases, but if there's a possibility that a client switches sides, or, or especially if an iterative resolver sees both sides if you split horizon, then things could get ugly. Uh, so you have to understand I, I worry, what's I worry involved. I about that a little bit in terms of uh, like where things are going with this. I know um, Google made some announcement recently about uh, Android is going to have like a, you know, uh, it's going to ignore whatever DHCP server, whatever D, uh, name servers are provided by DHCP and is going to connect directly to theirs over over TLS or something like right. that. Right. Paul Waters of, of, of DNSOP, in fact, is really worried about this trend. Um, because indeed there are many reasons why you might want to consume the DNS name servers that you get from your network. For example, you might actually be connecting over an IPsec VPN right. uh, into the office, and you really don't exactly. want uh, the Cloudflare's view of DNS at that point. Yeah. Uh, and so the proposal to have the browsers bypass the DNS settings for your network in fact, introduce significant issues in some cases, and that all of that will have to play out and be resolved. We're in interesting times. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's one oh. last person. Or do we oh, have sorry, time go for ahead. one last person? One more. Uh, thank you. Um, a question. Is there any proposal or plan for DNSSEC to provide privacy and not just authentication? Uh, DNSSEC itself, no. Okay. Uh, so that would be DeepRive. You would run DNSSEC inside some, uh, some tunnel, which is what DeepRive effectively does. Runs DNSSEC over TLS. I wish it weren't TLS. I think it should have gone over TCP Inc., uh, whatever, T TCP with some sort of opportunistic crypto or, or even authenticated TCP. I think uh, HTTPS and TLS are really uh, too much uh, intermediate layers for DNS. But that's not the way the working group uh, turned. And uh, frankly, I didn't participate enough to object, so I have nothing to say about that. Uh, so uh, I, I assumed others would reach good conclusions. They didn't reach conclusions I would have agreed with, but my fault for not participating. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're now going to go to the Cupping Room Cafe, which is a couple blocks away. Um, I'll see you guys there. Thank you. Cupping Room Cafe. Uh, the address is 359 West Broadway. That is the Cupping Room Cafe.